All right, everyone, we're going to get started. Um, I'm really happy that my friend Ann Cameron from the University of Michigan agreed to come. This sort of came about when we were practicing AUA presentations in the spring. I don't know if you all remember, we were sort of talking about um, presentation style and how to improve it. And so I immediately thought of Ann, because although she is um, highly accomplished, and has leadership roles at the University of Michigan. She's on the board of SUFU, on the board of SWU, and an expert in many um, areas of urology. The residents got to hear a great presentation on recurrent UTIs last night. She's um, been on white papers for the AUA regarding antibiotic uh, prophylaxis and stewardship, um, and also an expert in neurourology. I think one of her unique contributions to the field is um, the, the science of presentations, which she spent a lot of time perfecting. Um, and uh, the presentations are a way that we communicate, um, not just in academics, but also um, if you're doing community outreach, if you're communicating with the hospital, there's many times <clears throat> when this is how we're presenting our professional selves. And I think we don't do a very good job of it a lot, a lot of times. So Anne really opened my eyes to how, and I think the residents could speak to that from what they saw last night. There's some really innovative ways that we should be thinking about presenting some of our hard work and expertise. So um, I am going to leave it to Dr. Cameron to tell us about kick-ass presentations. All right, great, thank you, Dr. Ricky. So uh, thank you very much for the invitation. It's my, uh, my pleasure to be here uh, and to have such a nice evening last night with um, some of your colleagues. And it was um, a great opportunity to get to speak to your residents and fellows last night. So you can see this is not um, the title that was on the flyer, um, Lucia and I decided that maybe we should uh, vanilla the title for the public flyers, but this is really the title of my talk, has always been um, how to create and deliver a kick-ass scientific presentation. So this um, presentation came about after I attended a seminar on public speaking. I actually went to the seminar because I really wanted a half day off from clinic, to be totally honest, um, and it was, an incredibly eye-opening experience. The woman delivering the content of this presentation was so astoundingly skilled and polished that I really only had my phone out on Amazon to order all of the books that she recommended during the talk. And over the next three months, I spent that time reading those books. I actually spent a 24-hour flight to Melbourne reading all those books and then changing all my talks because I was going to Melbourne to give several presentations. And in the conclusion of this, I decided that this is something that is not well known. People know how to give TED Talks. There's many seminars and series on how to give good oration or good um, uh, you know, political speeches, but there's no good resource on how to give a good scientific presentation, which we all do. So this is the culmination of all that work. I do lots and lots of public speaking, and I've never put the amount of time that I've put into any of these, this type of talk. Um, and just to uh, give a full disclosure, if I'm going to make fun of a slide, it's going to be mine. So I'm not making fun of anyone else's work if you see me um, uh, criticizing a slide during some of my talk today. So here are my disclosures, none of them relevant to uh, my talk today. So everyone is inherently afraid of speaking in front of an audience. This is a truth, this is a fact. And if that's not true for you, if you're sitting there going, actually, I have no anxiety and no worry about giving a talk, well then please go get a coffee and go do the rest of your work because uh, this talk is for everyone who does have a little bit of anxiety or a lot of anxiety surrounding giving a public speech because I have anxiety surrounding that. And I'm gonna explain a little bit about why that happens so maybe you can use that to your advantage. So. This is the famous Bruskin report, often quoted as people are more afraid of public speaking, which you see as the thing that people list as being most afraid of, than death. So this is actually not true. The scientific methods behind this study were that the participants were given a blank sheet of paper and asked to write down what they were most afraid of. This was not a multiple choice question, so no one said they were more afraid of public speaking than death, but that's you know, how this uh, study is often interpreted. So why are we afraid? So we are all mammals, every single one of us. And as mammals, we are trying to survive every single day. And things that threaten your survival are standing in an open space with no weapon, nowhere to hide, and having front-facing eye beings 
staring at you. So predator face, staring at you. So when I'm standing up here, this is what I really am seeing, but this is what I'm feeling. This is me. <laughs> so it's a normal reaction to feel an adrenaline rush or a little bit of anxiety standing in front of a group of people. That's not unusual. That's not abnormal. That's not because I'm a poor public speaker. It's because I'm a human. So get over it. Use that energy. Use that adrenaline drive to fuel your talk. So my mission today is to go over how to plan a kick-ass presentation, how to engage your audience so that your message resonates with them, how to design really great slides so that your audience can capture your message and how to deliver your presentation in the best way possible. So why does this matter? So you all have great ideas. You've done great scientific work. And this work, if no one knows it, listens to it, or cares about it, doesn't matter. So your ideas, which are awesome, need to be disseminated to other people so they can reflect on your ideas and build on them. That's how science works. So if you can't share that with other people so that they remember it, then it's pointless. So let's talk about planning. So this is my philosophy about all talks that I give. I try to keep them as simple as possible, at least with respect to slides and the slide deck, because I want my message to shine through, not crazy slides. So that's my philosophy. It's not everyone's philosophy, but you'll see that theme throughout my talk, and I'll go over some other ways of approaching things. So in all my research, I could only find one resource on how to plan a scientific talk. And the formula is very simple, and I actually really like it. Tell them what you're going to tell them, tell them, and then tell them what you told them. So that's, that's really how all scientific talks are organized, and it's very straightforward, and I really like this. So this is from Dazzle and with Style, which is a, a book, the only reference I could find on scientific talks. I can't recommend that book, because that was, this was probably the only gem from that. But, um, but again, this is a great framework to think of when you're planning a talk. But it's up to you as the author of the talk to establish structure. It's up to you to organize a talk in a very sensible way so that your audience can follow along with you. Again, I have lots of random boxes, a Lego around my house, so that's why I came up with that, but it's just, it's, it's crazy. If your audience can't follow your talk, then you, you haven't established enough structure for them. So a great way to establish structure is to create a storyboard. When you're planning a talk, there are lots of different ways of doing it, but one really creative way is to actually step back, step away from your computer and your media to sit down with a bunch of post-it notes and write down the points that you want to make. Maybe you're going to draw a picture, write a point or a paragraph, and then reorganize them in a way that makes sense. So it's a story, a storyboard, a logical flow of thought, and then go back to your computer and then start the planning process. This seems to work really well for me. Everyone can find their own way, but you need a structure. You can't just start at slide one and start creating your talk because again, then it's going to be a random pile of facts. So adult attention span was uh, 12 seconds in the year 2000, decreasing to eight seconds in 2013, which is just a second shorter than goldfish who have an attention span of nine seconds, which was consistent throughout this time frame. So this is a little bit of a joke and this is based on browser history. So over time, humans spend less time looking at a browser before flicking to the next, uh, the next page. But this is an important point because attention span is shrinking, shrinking dramatically. And etiquette during a presentation has changed dramatically. Everyone in this room has at least one, probably two, maybe three electronic devices on their person. So it's no longer rude for someone to have their laptop up during a talk. It's no longer rude for someone to send a text check their messages, or answer a page during a talk. Uh, that has changed. You just have to get over that. So it's up to you as the presenter to deliver a talk that is interesting, engaging, and exciting enough that people actually want to put their phone down and maybe wait until you're done to answer their pages. And I see people putting away their stuff. Thanks. <laughs> so in reality, adults have a five-minute attention span. This is wrapped attention. So adults and older children have a five-minute attention span. So that's how long you have of full attention. 
However, 20 minutes is what you have if you are very engaging and interesting. So how on earth do we keep people's attention for hours at a time? Everyone can sit through a movie for two hours and are very rarely bored during those movies. So how do they do that? So this is um, some real data on an audience attention curve over 40 minutes. You can see we got a lovely, ooh, a lovely peak here around five minutes and then everything drops down drops in and then everyone gets really excited at the end because they're done. <laughs> but, but really, this is reality. <clears throat> so you have to battle against this. And you can do that by changing topics. So every five minutes, you need a subtopic. Change a pace, change a paragraph, change of scene. That's how movies do that. Watch a movie next time and see how often the scene changes. It's between every three and five minutes that you're in a new scene. So your attention is grabbed and there's something new to look at. And then, then you have a strong finale. And then you actually have people's attention for the whole time of your talk. So I'm a firm believer in this. You really need to edit your talks. Talks are often too long, and you need to get out the big old scissors. Sometimes you spend a lot of time on a slide, a concept, an idea, and it just doesn't fit. The flow is not working. This doesn't belong in your talk. Oh, I spent all this time on this. Get rid of it. Please get rid of it. because. You want your talk to flow smoothly. You want it to be a cohesive body of work. And no one has ever been in an end of a talk that has gone over time and been like, oh man, I wish she'd talk another two minutes, you know, two minutes past your due time. People get really irate when you go over time. So you expect your audience to be respectful of you. You would like your audience to listen to you and maybe be quiet while you're talking. Don't go over time and disrespect them by not valuing their time. They have things to do that they have put off. They have pages waiting. They have patients waiting. They have ORs waiting. Be respectful. Never, ever go over time. If you start late and early, too bad. That's the time you were given because people get really, really angry and that leaves a sour note. So how do you engage your audience? So the most engaging talks have a very succinct message. And the elevator test is you could explain something during an elevator ride. So you should be able to explain your talk in two to three sentences to anyone. What your talk about, you could answer that question in two to three sentences. If it fails the elevator test, then you need to restructure and you need to go back to the drawing board. So when you're starting a talk, people often have these weird thoughts in their heads that, oh, I, I bet they're hoping I'm going to fall or or maybe I'm going to trip going up the stairs, but no one in the audience is sitting there thinking, wow, I hope her slides fail. <laughs> I hope this talk gets canceled. No one's thinking that. People are mostly thinking random thoughts. They're chatting amongst their friends. They're planning their day ahead. No one has, you know, is really actually thinking about you before you start your talk. So you have eight seconds to engage them, to capture their attention, to get them to listen to what you have to say. So what do you do in your first eight seconds? So giving a positive first impression is probably the best way to start a talk. It also helps alleviate a lot of anxiety because if your initial eight seconds go really well, a lot of that wave of anxiety that you have standing here tends to tamponade down. So you really want your first impression to be really good. When you all came in, my first slide was up, not the disclosure CME slide. Um, it was actually my first slide, which you know, to me is a really fun slide and maybe got people's attention. I also started um, my presentation with a little story. Uh, stories are a very effective way of communicating with other humans. We actually undergo neural coupling when we share stories, not data and facts. No neural coupling happens when we share data and facts. But when we share stories that have a little bit of an emotional context, then people neurally couple with one another. So that's a really effective way of starting a talk. I don't do jokes. If you want to do a joke, go right ahead. Um, I, I don't, that's not my skill set. But again, you really want a good opener for every talk that you're going to give. So this is probably the most important concept about any, giving any talk. How do you get your audience to engage with you? And you do that by being transparent. So you do that by being yourself while you up here. Be transparent so that people can actually hear your ideas and see what you have to say. And one way of doing that is by being honest. 
If you did a randomized controlled trial that went askew, you had to change all your methods and then the FDA put your trial on hold and then you got your FDA trial off hold, share that with your audience. People love a good, you know, coming back from the drudges type of story. That will resonate with people emotionally and they'll really remember your point. You know, no one's perfect and no one wants their presenter to be a perfect person. Um, being real is also very important, you know, being yourself, being real, because people resonate with another human. They don't resonate with a robot giving a presentation. Um, being exposed, um, sharing some vulnerability. I shared some vulnerability earlier in my talk with you that I am a little bit afraid of giving presentations. That resonates with people. You know, you don't want me to be perfect. You don't need me to be perfect. Being unique is okay. Um, if you're not a black suit and gray shirt and a black tie kind of person, that's quite all right. If you have cool glasses or you really like the color red, uh, there's, there's no reason you can't do that during a talk. Uh, being passionate is also very important. If someone is excited about something, the people in the audience will be excited about that same thing. That's a normal human reaction that you share the emotion of the presenter. So if you're going to want people to be passionate, then you should be yourself. And just be you. Um, interesting sidebar because I have an extra minute. I uh, gave three talks at a Sufu preceptorship course on, say, a Friday. And I gave three lectures that day, almost back to back with this very large audience of people. And I was very much myself um, and that, because that's how I give talks. But the audience actually gets to know you quite well because you're on for all that time. And if you're being yourself and being transparent and being honest with your audience, they really feel like they get to know you. So at conferences and lectures, people come and talk to me all the time because I've shared some of myself with them. It's also great for networking. It's also a great way to get to know people. But sometimes it backfires. So in, I'm in Chicago and I go for a run at 6.30 in the morning, which is often my habit, and I'm running down the street. And if anyone runs at all, if there is a woman running and a man running towards her, the man always yields to the female runner. If you try to yield to them, it's all confusing. You'll both end up in the side on the bushes. So you just, you just let the guy yield to you because that's just the polite way of running. So this guy's running towards me and he's not moving. Like he's running straight towards me and it's narrow. There's the road. I'm like, what am I going to do? I'm going to keep running because I'm going to look strong. And, um, and as he's running by me, I actually jumped into the street because I'm like, what the heck is this guy doing? And he walked by me and he put his hand up to give me a high five. And he goes, hey, doc. And I realized he was one of my participants who tried to high five me at 6.30 in the morning because he thought he knew me. <laughs> I obviously didn't know him. I apologized to him later for, for dissing him. But, but again, your audience will really get to know you and they'll feel very connected with you, which is a good thing because you make a lot of connections that way. So this is another really great way of engaging your audience and capturing their attention. Once they get over the two second shock of, oh my goodness, her slides just failed. Um, they, when there's nothing visual for them to listen to or to see, they'll actually focus all their attention on you. You can hit control W to make a white screen or control B, but I always end up messing that up. So I always just plan a white slide in my talk because it's so much easier than fiddling with the keyboard, which is, I don't even know where over there. So, so try to keep it simple and do that. Another really great way of making a point resonate, sink in, or stick with people is to actually insert a pause in your speech. And you have to stop for at least six seconds after you're, you're done talking for it to sink in. I count in my head too, because I have to. I talk way too fast, so I have to count. But it really does resonate. And you can't overuse this. You can't do this at the end of every slide, but you know, save it for your conclusion. The big point you want to make, give yourself a pause right afterwards, and then people will sit there and nod their head and really let that sink in. So slide design is my next topic. Um, this is probably the area that I get the most questions from my trainees is how can I make my slides look better? So I really believe this to be true. Nancy Duarte's wrote a uh, fantastic, uh, two fantastic books on presentations. Um, and really, I totally agree with this. Beautifying slides does not make them better slides. It's the content that matters. And just for everyone's reference, I do have all of my references today um, in a handout that Lucia has. So if you're, instead of trying to copy down where my references are coming from, she has those if you want them. So slides are not handouts. 
If you're creating a talk and you expect to print out your PowerPoint and use that as your handout, then you need to go back to the drawing board because your slides are garbage <laughs> if they're useful as a handout. Um, I try to make every single talk so that my slides are basically worthless without me. So my slides have no value other than they look nice uh, without me present to give the talk. So they're not a document either. If you're taking a paper you wrote and you're copying the text and then you're dropping it in a slide and deleting a few words, this is the wrong approach to doing slides because that's a document. Nor are my slides a teleprompter. So I know that's really hard to do. It's really hard to memorize your slides and know what you're gonna say, but that's what practice is for. So a teleprompter is not what your slides are for. They are slides. So these, all these three slides are actually on the same topic, and you can see what's certainly much more visually appealing to people. So if I read my slides, are you actually listening to me, or are you reading the slide with me? Your brain is actually less able to focus on the speaker when there's text available to read. Your brain can't help but read the text and check for accuracy in my speech. So think of closed caption television and how you can't help but focus on the text and mix the visual image in front of you. You miss the core image, regardless of how animated I am. So this drives me crazy, that's why I reiterated the point. You can't read your slides, that's not what they're there for. So I have everything I've said today written down. This is not me winging it. Um, everything that I've said has been written down on a slide. I usually type it in a Word document. It is saved in presenter view in every single one of my slides. So when I go to practice, I leave it in presenter view, I practice, I know exactly what I'm gonna say, but I'm not reading it today and it's probably not word for word, but that's where my slides have value and that's where the memory cue comes. And you think you're gonna freeze and you think you're not gonna remember what you're gonna say, but you spent all that time typing it all out anyway. So the material is there and when you review it, the material is all there and it's so much more effective than having people trying to read your slides. So people talk about slide rules. Um, so what rule do you use? Is there a certain number of slides? Um, I've heard dozens of different rules. I've seen some of the best presentations I've ever seen have been five slides in an hour. Also, some of the best presentations I've seen have been 45 slides in 20 minutes. So there is no slide rule. There is no number of slides that's just right. I know, for me, I am a 30-second a slide kind of person. That's, I'm super consistent. So if I have 60 slides in 30 minutes, I know I got it right. And you'll figure that out about yourself, about how you speak and your style. Um, and then there's this 177 rule, which exists out there. So you can have one topic, seven bullet points, and seven words per line. I think that's 49 too many words per slide. So um, I would never recommend that to anyone. I think that's the one rule. You should have one topic, maybe one or two words on a slide, and that's probably plenty. Um, so I, I really don't ascribe to specific rules, except this one. It's called the billboard rule. So if any of you have heard of anything in advertising, the billboard rule is that any billboard should be able to be digested in three seconds. So clearly this is not an adequate uh, billboard because there's way too much information, but everyone should be able to look at my slide, read the one line or the few words or the message in three seconds and then redirect their attention back to me. So that's a little bit difficult when you are presenting scientific data. So that rule does not apply to scientific data when you're going to explain it. But when you're just going to speak, your slide should only capture people's attentions for about three seconds. So there are font rules, however, that I do ascribe to. Uh, I do not use anything lower than 36 point font in a presentation, then everyone can see it, even the people in the back. Uh, even for graphs and figures, I don't go below 20 point font. So this is a really great rule to use because when you're making a presentation, you can ask yourself, is this font okay? Increase the size. Uh, your background and type are very important. Um, it may look fine on your computer, but it does not look well projected. So these are some examples of okay and not okay. And stick to a standard font. Don't be shifting fonts unless it's absolutely necessary because it's very distracting to the eye. It causes a little bit of dissonance. We are used to seeing text in the same font all the time, and we like that. So um, these are probably my only rules about slides. So here is my, my title slide, and it's actually very visually appealing, and it's very visually appealing because it uh, appeals to the same rules that apply to uh, photography. You know, your, your tic-tac-toe box of 
points of interest um, actually apply to this slide. You can see the intersections are his eyes, my title, and his hands. So the points of interest are on those areas. And I really like this slide. I spent a lot of time on this slide, and that's why this slide was my very first slide. I don't spend you know, vast amounts of time on every slide, but on your title slide, you really want to make sure that it is well done. And um, here was my original plan for this talk, and I really like this picture. I just really liked it, but this is why it doesn't work. It just doesn't work. It's not visually appealing. It just didn't resonate with me the same way that my original slide was, and you can see what that is. And again, I'm, I'm not a photographer. I'm not creating a fashion magazine. You don't need to do this for every slide, but if you really have something that you want to emphasize, you can um, utilize some of these rules. The other interesting point is eye tracking. So as humans, if you see everyone looking in the same direction, you are going to look in that direction as well. So this is eye tracking from web browsers. So here you see the baby looking forward and everybody looks at the baby's face. But if the baby is looking at the text or the message, then your eyes gear towards this. And you're like, oh, I can't be that easily fooled. Yes, you can. So here's this slide and here's the slide inverted with the text away from her eyes. Doesn't that look odd? It just seems really, really strange to have the text away from someone's face. So if you're going to put anything, it doesn't have to be a human, it could be an animal or a creature, but if they're looking at something, make sure your point is where they are looking. And so this is the most awful format of slides that exists. So there's the title and then there's a list of words. This actually isn't too wordy, so it's not too bad. And then there's some random photo, like, <laughs> like what is this doing here? Like, this is a slide about superheroes. Like, we all know what a superhero is, right? You don't need, like, this little rando picture here. So, so what is the point of the picture? Again, this is just beautification for the sake of beautification. This has no point. So don't just insert a random picture in the corner because that serves no purpose. It's distracting from your message. So here is um, my um, introductory slide where I'm giving you all the plan. I love full bleed pictures. I really like them. I think they're very simple. I think they don't detract from my message. I think that they are visually, visually very aesthetically pleasing. And you'll see that they are the theme throughout my entire talk. Almost every slide, other than the slides where I'm making fun of myself, have full bleed pictures in them. And this is my style. It doesn't have to be your style. This is from Presentation Zen from Gar Darwood, a fantastic book on presentations, which is included in the references but this is just the way that I like to do things. There are lots of other exceptional ways of doing that. This is from uh, one of our medical students at the University of Michigan employing a much more visual abstract style. So this was his introductory slide on 3D printing of the kidney. So this is his first slide, his introduction. This is what I'm gonna talk about today. And this is his transition slide. Isn't that clever? Doesn't that look nice? Very visually appealing. It's not distracting. He, uh, and again, this is another slide from the middle of his talk that was you know, super visually appealing. This is Jake Claflin, one of our current med students. So this is the visual abstract style. Again, here's another way of doing an introduction. Pick your, pick your poison, pick the way that you wanna do it, but stick to a style during at least one talk and um, have that continue throughout your talk. And a theme is always nice. I mean, if you haven't caught the theme of my talk, then maybe I'm not doing a very good job. But you know, there's a core theme, especially in a longer lecture like this one, you really want to tie it all together by keeping the theme a little bit more cohesive. You can also do that by having your visual images match. So I gave a talk, which I'm going to show you the slides from in a second. Um, and if you just type in dipstick, balloon, toilet, and birthday cake, these are the first images that show up. And if you put them all together, that's not a very visually appealing group of slides. They actually don't match. Some of them are rather poor. And you can do a little bit better than that when you're planning for a talk. Maybe have all of your slides be visually cohesive. This was only a 12 slide talk. So all of the slides in that talk were very visually cohesive. My numbering was the same. My font was the same. I used the same X and checkbox um, on, on each of these slides. And if you're, especially if you're doing a short talk, look at all your slides in the outline view to make sure that they all match with one another. Your audience is not going to notice this, but they're going to feel like it was a really cohesive, visually pleasing talk. They don't, it's not overt. It will all be to you. So next time you hear me speak, you're going to be like, you're right. She really does that. But 
you know, to your audience, it won't resonate as to why your talk was so visually appealing. And if you're going to steal clip art, like, don't steal, you know, patented clip art with like the do not distribute thing. Like that looks terrible. That's absolutely terrible. Like don't even have an image if, if you're going to steal something like this. And, and if you really want to get the creative juices going, if you need a picture of someone brushing their teeth, get out your camera. So this was from a talk that I, um, I gave where I was comparing catheterization to toothbrushing. So this is my, my eldest. Um, so I just took a picture of him and, and threw it in the talk. And it was very effective. I don't want pictures of my whole family in all my talks, but, but sometimes this can be effective to have a fun picture. And if you need a picture of an apple, well, everybody can find an apple somewhere and take a picture of it if you can't find what you need on the internet. And remember that sometimes things are trademarked. And if you steal work and your slides are published and are online, potentially someone could sue you for copyright infringement. It's probably not going to happen, but if you can use your own images, then all the better. And if you can't get pictures that fit with one another and are not cohesive, you can also use the PowerPoint filter. So this is the same photo, just using artistic effects on your photos. Right click on the photo, go to artistic effects, and apply the same artistic effect to all the photos. It'll blend them all, so you make them all black and white, or you, this is all a pencil art look. So you can really um, uh, change the appearance of your photos. It's also a great way to de-identify a photo. So if you have a, this is not my patient, this is a random picture from the internet. But if you have a patient photo and you don't want people to know who they are, you can just apply these artistic effects. So th this is one of my slides. Um, so again, you know, the, there's a lot of text in this slide. There's, um, there's this like random picture of a water bottle. Um, this is not a very visually appealing slide and it, and it kind of emphasizes the value of white space. I use white space a lot in my slides. It's very clean, it's very crisp. It emphasizes the point. People know I'm gonna talk about water. I can memorize those three or four lines and then give the point. And that's much more effective than the slide with all the words and then the little picture in the corner. So, so try to keep that in mind when you're doing slides. Not every slide has to be a full white space slide, but that is very visually appealing. This is the visual abstract concept that I touched on. It was actually a, a concept created at the University of Michigan by Andrew Ibrahim while he was a medical student. He's now a resident there. Um, you can look him up online. I have his um, website. So he gives a full instruction on how to create a visual abstract or visual abstract style slides. Very professional. These are very professional, very scientific looking, and very engaging and not distracting. So I'm a huge fan of these um, if, if that's the way you want to go. So sometimes your picture that you've chosen is just not fitting. It's just not fitting. So here's my zebra from earlier, but he doesn't look very lonely in this photo. He really doesn't. He actually looks a little bit menacing. So he really didn't convey being afraid. So what can you do to take this perfect picture and make it work for you? So you can shrink it down, you can add some white space, and this is just duplicated grass behind me. So I've actually expanded this photo to, and if you create hash lines in your eyes, you can see that zebra is in one of those hash lines. So again, I don't do this for every slide, but sometimes you have the right picture and it won't fit the perspective of your, your slides, and you can do a little bit of editing that took about four or five minutes. So, so you can really take what you've got and, and make it work for you because I really like this zebra who looks really all alone. Um, I understand that no one is gonna put a picture of Spider-Man for one of their three slides at the AUA. I get it. Uh, you have constraints, you have limits, you have prescribed number of slides that are given to you, follow the rules. You have to do it. If you're told three slides in three minutes, that's what you're gonna do. So you have to work within your limits, but there are ideal situations that you can work from. So an ideal talk is 20 minutes long. There is no coincidence that TED Talks are exactly 20 minutes in length because that's the maximum amount of time you can engage people. If you have your choice, don't speak right after lunch. That's a terrible time to speak. Don't speak right before a cocktail hour. Oh, that's the worst time to give a talk. <laughs> and, uh, and, and preferably not speaking right after the most legendary urologist on the planet. That's also a poor time to speak because everybody gets up and leaves. But you don't always have that choice. But if someone does give you the choice and asks you how long do you want to speak for, 20 minutes is awesome. 20 minutes is a really great, uh, great time. But you have to follow the rules if people give them to you. So here's a slide of mine, again, um, where data can be presented in a poor way. Everyone's done this. You just take the table out of the paper and you copy it from Adobe and you just like put it in there. No one can actually read it unless you're in the front row. 
and then you add some like animation and some bouncy things and some spinning and some wheeling to try to emphasize the point. Everyone's seen this slide before, and this one's mine. This is my slide, totally my slide. Uh, pretty uninspiring. Um, so if you, this is the core message. So this was part of a talk that I did on bladder cancer and neurogenic bladder. This was the core message of my talk. So I actually redid the slide and put it into a bubble population graph. All the same data is right here, all of it. And if you really want to emphasize something, and instead of using the shaky laser pointer, which everyone does and everyone goes like this, um, just circle what you're going to say, plan it out, because you know what you're going to say, and then people's attention continues to be drawn in that way. And, and Hans Rosling, who, who's a, a Swedish scientist, a population scientist, actually did a, an outstanding TED Talk on how to turn data into meaning, because we all understand size, we all understand position on a graph. It's really hard to interpret numbers in a real way. So this you know, bubble graph is an example of a way that you can take scientific data and actually make it mean something for your audience. Because data is not meaningful unless you can put it in a context or make it real, visually appealing to people. So numbers, not so much. A graphic representation is a good way. This is another really great way of <clears throat> emphasizing a point. If your results were three out of 30, you could actually show this. That resonates very well with people. It puts it in context. We are, we're not very good with numbers. We're very good with visual images. Or if you really want to emphasize the point three, you can just put three, and, and then people will actually listen to what you have to say. <clears throat> um, we all have to represent scientific data. We all need graphs and charts to explain our findings. I try not to make that the core of a talk, but they need to be there. So how do you make them understandable, appealing, and useful for the audience? I guarantee it's not copying and pasting it out of the journal. So in the journal, you're creating a graph for a reader audience. They can look at the legend, they can look at the title, they can figure out what's on the graph, but your job is to actually explain the graph to your audience, but you have to make it visually appealing for them. So you can do this by having a set background that's very simple, add your data that's not important, and then add the emphasis data, the data that really matters, and then put them together. And then you can really show your results to people. You don't do this in a journal because people have the time to read it, but no one has time to read it here. You want them to be able to see it easily and emphasize your point. And again, you don't need all the fine print. You may want to put a star to show significance, but again, you don't want people to have to squint and look at your slide to understand the meaning. You always want to back up your data with facts. If someone wants the reference for your talk, have it available to them so they can scrutinize it, but no one has the time to scrutinize it right here. So this is um, from the Bre Breskin Report. This was the original table from the Breskin Report. And I actually didn't like it, which is why I didn't use this original graph. You can see how speaking before a group is here and all my titles. And it's, I don't know, it just, the, the font was too small. It just didn't look right. It really, I, I'd used it several times in talks and it just um, was displeasing to me visually. So this is why I created this version of it. Again, all minimum 20 point font. I decreased the, um, uh, the legend to be smaller a number of words and uh, emphasize the point and use this. But it's very visually appealing if it's really important to you. You don't have to redo every graph in your talk, but if it really, really matters to you, then you'll do it. So what about delivery of your talk? So I believe this to be very true. You have to be prepared. If you're not prepared for your talk, then it's going to go very poorly and your anxiety is going to be really high, which is going to compound the effect. So how do you prepare for a talk? Well, you got to practice. You can practice in front of a mirror. You can practice in your hotel room. You can practice in front of your phone. That's a great way to do it. Record yourself giving a talk. Would you look yes. Okay. Um, you could record yourself and then view it. That's the most humiliating way to do it uh, because it's very, very difficult to listen to yourself speak, but it's incredibly valuable. So I often have people record me giving a talk and then I'll watch it later. Not later that day, because it's too horrible, but um, I give myself a week and then I'll, I'll, I'll have a look at it. But it makes a very big difference in your presentation because if you don't orally practice, I'm not talking practicing in your head, even if you just whisper, you can flow one slide to the next. Because when I switch slides, I'm already speaking about the next slide before I flip. 
I'm preparing you for the next slide. And I can only do that if I actually practice speaking it. And sometimes you practice a talk and you're like, wow, how do I transition between those two slides? And it's because it's too dissonant. And so you have to rearrange things. So you'll learn that while you're practicing out loud. The ums, the uhs, the you knows, the likes, the mm ha's that you give in your speech. So those are fillers. We all use them in conversations between one another. And the reason that they exist is that you don't want someone to interrupt you. In between sentences, while you're regrouping, you add a filler so that the person you're speaking to realizes you're not done talking. So that's why you do it. And we all do it in common language, but it's really annoying to hear a speaker do that. And I'm sure I do it. After this, everyone's gonna count how many times I do it. But it's, it's annoying. And the way that you get rid of this in your speech is to actually become aware of it. So have someone record you giving a talk and then four or five days later, go back and look at it and play a little game with yourself where you record every time you inserted an annoying filler. And if you do this enough times, you will actually break that habit. You'll actually break it very quickly because you realize how mortifying it is that you've done this. But the reason that it's so annoying is that when you say a sentence, that sentence ends with a period. And if you add a filler, then the person listening to you does not have time to register point A and that you're starting a new point B. They think that the two ideas are merged together. So you have to have a period at the end of your sentence so that people know you're done. So Mark Twain um, made most of his money in his life public speaking. And I really like this quotation by him because everyone is nervous when they're public speaking. And things that people are afraid of are their voice cracking, you know, forgetting what they're going to say, butterflies in their stomach, dry mouth, shaking, heart racing. I'm not going to go over any of these in detail. Mine is voice cracking, terrible voice cracking at the beginning of a talk. Um, and there are ways around that. There's some voice exercises you can do um, to counteract that. But we all have something that we're afraid of. And, and if anyone wants to come talk to me at the end of the talk, I'm happy to go over those with you. And there are techniques to overcome them. There are things you can do to make that better. And it's certainly not picturing the audience naked, which is the most common advice given to public speakers. Uh, this was attributed to Winston Churchill. He was a famous orator. Um, he was well known for his riveting and passionate speeches. But he said that's when someone asked him, you know, how do you do it? And he said, oh, I picture them all naked. Um, but, you know, he did drink a bottle of champagne and a fifth of bourbon before every single public speech he did. So um, you have to take that with a little bit of a grain of salt. But I guarantee that picturing people naked is not the way to go because it doesn't help anybody. This is a great um, uh, um, uh, book on how to conquer fear. But how do I conquer the day? Um, so my main advantage is knowing what's coming next. I know what my next slide is because I'm prepared. I'm like a stand-up comedian. I can bum, 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 and then give the point. So being prepared really helps you conquer the day because you know what's coming next and your slides flow really, really well. Having your audio visuals be ready, ready to go and solid before you go. Make friends with the audio visual people, have them test your slides and also be nice to them because if your slides fail at the very beginning, if you've been nice to those people, they are going to run up and fix your slides for you instead of going, he, he, that jerk, <laughs> and take their time. <clears throat> Excuse me, take their time. So there's some, some really great ways of doing that. And also be aware, are you a full stomach kind of person? Are you a caffeinated person? Are you a get some exercise before your talk kind of person? Have a ritual, have a routine. Um, wear something you feel comfortable in. Um, if you prefer to be in high heels when you give a talk, by all means do it. That's not my thing, but I do wear fierce shoes when I talk. Um, so that makes me feel better and it makes me feel more powerful. And this is, I'm not wearing lucky underwear, but again, that might be your thing. Um, power posing, um, the concept came up by a Amy Cuddy. She gave a TED talk on it, involves um, assuming power poses for five minutes prior to a talk. This is the Wonder Woman. Um, much of this data has been somewhat refuted because no one's been able to replicate her work. But I'm a firm believer in assuming a very positive stance. I don't think it maybe necessarily changes your cortisol level, your testosterone level, but I've been a singer, I've been a woodwind player, I've done acting in the past, and there's nothing like a positive physical presence to convey your message to your audience. 
don't stand here. Don't do this. Don't do this. Please don't do this when you're giving a talk. Step out here if you can. Two feet on the floor, not like this. Okay, none of this conveys a positive message. Two feet, two shoulders facing the audience. It's yoga, open heart, open heart. And if you're really feeling brave, you can practice and, and, and exercise this, but I recommend that in the restroom before you start. <laughs> Anyone can subtly do this, but, but not, not this. But again, I believe in the value of this. I do this all the time. Open heartedness before your talk will prepare you to be open hearted while you're here because we all do want to hide. So how about an ending? No matter how things went, end strong. Thank you. That's a good one. Thank you. I'm happy to take any questions. That's another good one. But don't apologize. Don't like limp off of stage. Oh, that wasn't boring or, or that's it. You know, don't, don't let your voice fade and drop off and cower away and slither away at the end of your talk. Um, even if, you know, a few bad things happen, you had a few slip ups along the way, you're only human, at least end strong. Welcome questions. If anybody does not ask a question at the end of this talk, I'm going to be really disappointed because <laughs> um, questions are a sign of audience interest and most people in the audience are not out to get you or humiliate you. So here is my reference list. Um, this is the series of books that might have actually been helpful, which are included in my handout. Um, these are some uh, really great TED Talks that are quite inspirational. Um, I love watching a great orator speak. I think I learn something from every single experience. So I think that that's a great way to practice um, public speaking. And these are just some outtakes from Wesley. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm happy to take any questions. I like the abstract style of mm -hmm. presentations, but you know, how do you make those? How do you find those images? How do you design them? You know, a lot of them are copyrighted or... So, so Andrew Ibrahim, uh, the resident who, who actually made that concept, he actually has a PDF tutorial free online, which explains step-by-step -step how to do that. And that's included in my reference list. It's, a, it's like a 40 page PDF with all the explanations. Yes. Right, no, no, exactly. As you said, preface it by being prepared. Uh, know how much time you have. I, um, I dread giving talks in rooms without a clock. That's the first thing I, I spied when I came in here is, oh, there's a clock. Thank goodness. Because I have, what, it's okay. No, but I knew, I knew how far ahead it was. Um, I have slide, I have points in my talk. I mean, this is an hour long talk. You really have to pace yourself. I have certain points in my talk where I know I need to be at a certain spot. So at slide, you know, X, I should be at 10 minutes. At slide this, I should be there. For an hour long talk, you have to do that because you're talking for a whole hour. So you have to plan that. Um, again, <clears throat> the best way, if your yellow light is flashing, um, again, jump ahead, get to your conclusion. Say, for the you know, apologize to your audience. For the sake of time and respect to the audience, I'm gonna jump ahead to my conclusions and again, you have, to, you have to blaze through and not go over time. Again, people have things to do. You're disrupting the whole thing. There's nothing worse than getting the big cane and being escorted off stage, which will happen, or turning off your mic. That's what happens at FDA hearings. That's really especially aggressive. But, <laughs> but again, you, that's, why, that's why you have to prepare. Yes. Um, it depends on the talk. Um, I am open to questions during my talk. Um, again, because I have buffers in an hour long talk where I can speed up or slow down. You notice how I shared a few anecdotes here and there. The anecdotes are the first thing to go. And again, I looked at the clock before I shared one of my anecdotes with you. Um, I welcome questions during a talk. I think if you want an interactive talk, most people do not interrupt you during a talk unless you invite it. 
um, my resident talk that I gave yesterday, I started out by asking the residents a question. So I, I pimped them. So of course they're gonna feel free to pimp back, which is great because that was the whole point of a much more intimate interactive talk. But this, this size of audience is just about the right size that I could have taken questions during the talk, but sometimes it's too big of an audience. So I think if you want questions, tell the audience right up front. If anybody has a question, please interrupt me. But if you don't want questions, then don't say anything because it would be rude to say, wait to the end. So I think most people know not to ask unless you invite. You have a question, yes. Um, could you share your thoughts on uh, moving around the room kind of a little bit while you're giving a talk, uh, pluses, minuses? Uh, I love it. Um, I pace a little bit. I realize I do that, uh, bad habit. Uh, but I think if you are not giving a talk with a lot of visual slides, so my slides are very visual, and I'm using those slides to reference my point every time because that's the whole point of this talk. But if I were to give a 20 minute talk with five slides, I would have wandered around the room. And I think it can be very effective because it's, it's totally different when I'm standing here and talking to you all. I could have done this, but then people had arranged themselves to see here. And if I'm giving this talk over here, everyone's head would have been like at a tennis match. I would have changed slides and they would have looked over there and they would have looked over here. So if you have slides, you got to stand near them. Otherwise, it's really annoying. But if you're just making a point and you have a slide every three or four minutes and you can totally wander around, especially if you're giving a much more personal talk. But again, you want to avoid the tennis. Do you, yes. got, do you have any examples of like where maybe something you thought it sounded better in your head and then it came out wrong and next thing you know, you feel like you're losing the room and you're embarrassed. How can you kind of bounce back from that and recover from that? <laughs> Uh, yes. <laughs> oh, no, that's, that's happened. Um, I've given anecdotes that didn't come out right, or you say things in the wrong order, and you realize you didn't make any sense. Um, I think you just need to pull up your pants and flip to the next slide and um, just ignore it and keep moving. Um, just get yourself back to somewhere where you feel confident. If you have enough transition points, you know, get to your next transition point and shake it off, maybe not do that move. But um, shake it off and, and, and start over again. Again, if you have transition points, you have refreshes. Like there's a spot where you're going to refresh in the next few slides. And if you have that refresh, you're ready to go. Obviously, you want to avoid those plugs, but oh, I've done it. I've done it. <laughs> yes. Maybe someone who is supposed to uh, give the talk is suddenly unavailable. If you don't have the advantage of that preparation time, what are some of your go-to tips? Um, I travel at all times with a thumb drive with at least four talks on it at all times. Um, I, organ I preface that by saying I organize meetings. So I'm a meeting planner for more than one meeting and someone's flight always gets canceled, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I always have talks in my thumb drive, which are tied to my handbag over there. I have at least five talks on that right now. I knew I wasn't gonna have to give a different talk here today, but it's just nice to have that there. I have them all on a shared drive that I have access to. So those are talks that I have, I've prepared on my own. If I was asked to give someone else's slides, that'd be a tough one. I, um, you know, I, I'd probably do it, but I'd probably spend a lot of time practicing ahead of time. And again, admit it to the audience. Say, I'm giving this talk, or Dr. Ricky, whose flight got canceled, she shared her slides with me. So please forgive my ill preparedness. Um, and, and that's fine. Great. Well, thank you very much, everyone. It was my pleasure being here.